Well, hello. This is our patrons only, uh, at least for a month or so. I've been putting the, the patrons videos, uh, making them public on YouTube after a month or two or three. But um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about a, a question that exists certainly in scholarly circles, and that one is that is in the back of my mind that I don't share uh, very often, uh, because uh, these sorts of issues are not uh, very uh, helpful in the church, but they exist in the, in the realm of truth, that is in the question of what, what actually is true. Um, and so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Peter in relation to the Gentiles. So in Acts 10, what, what, is the, what is the picture in Acts 10 with regard to Peter and the Gentiles? Well, um, for one thing, the book of Acts uh, makes it clear that, that Peter is the grounding of the Gentile mission. That is, when we, when we see, I believe it's in Acts 15, is it? Peter says something like, you all know that God first chose to bring the gospel of the Gentiles through me. Well, this is something that I think the Apostle Paul might have said, really? You, Peter? You're the apostle to the Jews. In fact, Paul calls him that, uh, I think, in Acts uh, chapter 10, uh, or maybe in Galatians 2. I'm not sure. He basically says that, that, um, they, that Paul says, Peter recognized that I'm sent to the Gentiles while he is sent to the Jews. So that, that's a, right there, a slightly different uh, impression we get. Uh, from the book of Acts and from Paul's writings themselves, that uh, Peter is is the grounding of the Gentile mission in the book of Acts, whereas Paul Paul would say not so much. I think um, this you know this is a, 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 a the kind of thing you expect between two different accounts. You know where both are true, uh, both accounts can be true, and yet one be giving you know kind of their the way it looks from their side of the street and the other giving how it looks from the other side of the street. Uh, but that's one, one thing. I didn't put that on this PowerPoint, but I'll come back to that in a second. Now, Peter in Acts 10, uh, he seems to have a devout uh, sense of the food laws and of the separation between Jew and Gentile. In other words, we get, we get the strong impression from Acts that Peter is a very scrupulous observer of the Jewish law and the holiness codes. Um, again, um, as, as I'll say on the next slide, I'm, that's, that's uh, Luke's account, and by Luke I mean the author of Acts. We don't know for sure who the author, it's anonymous, right? Luke Acts is anonymous. Um, but uh, Luke seems to give that impression. Would Peter, would you have gotten that impression from Peter himself if, you've, if you'd have interviewed Peter? that he was a scrupulous uh, law keeper? That's a, que a question mark. Um, again, I'm not saying that Peter was a flagrant law violator. I'm just saying that we have these, we have at least three perspectives uh, so far, even, even this far in the podcast slash video, three perspectives. You have Paul's perspective, you have Peter's perspective, and you have Luke's perspective. Um, three different perspectives that I, I'm assuming are largely overlapping, but there may be some you know, they're on three different corners of the street, um, and they saw the, the event slightly differently, maybe. Um, hold, the, hold on to that thought. So Peter gets the message of the vision. He goes willingly to the Gentiles. Um, he, he, he easily comes to the right conclusion, and of course, theologically, so a fourth perspective, let's say the perspective of the church, or this perspective of, uh, of Christianity, and that is that uh, all, all foods are now clean, uh, and that there is no person that is intrinsically unclean. This is Luke's perspective, uh, and I believe it is the Christian perspective. It is the, the, what we call the evaluative perspective of Acts, the theological perspective of Acts. The book of Acts wants us to conclude that no person is intrinsically unclean, and that no foods that God has cleansed are unclean, and that is the Christian perspective in my, my position. Uh, my understanding. That is the biblical perspective, I believe. Um, that is the canonical perspective, I believe. It is the tone of Scripture. So we've got these layers of perspective uh, that once you dig deeper into the Word, uh, begin to come out. Okay, so that's a little bit about Acts 10. What about Galatians chapter 2? Well, Peter, I will say that in the story in Acts 2 at, at Antioch, 
uh, in Galatians 2. Peter does not seem to be bothered with eating with Gentiles. That, that's the way the story in Galatians 2 starts off. Peter doesn't seem to be bothered by the idea of eating with Gentiles. And um, I, I think, I, I can't think of any reason to doubt what Paul says here from a historical perspective. Paul is arguing that Peter, now we don't know what was going on in his mind, uh, but it seems, it seems like Paul, Peter willingly eats with Gent, Gentile believers at Antioch at the beginning of that story. But Peter withdraws himself from, from Gentile Christians in Galatians 2. Why does he withdraw himself? Well, it's under peer pressure from James, and it's under peer pressure from people from James. Um, and so it seems to me that, that Peter himself doesn't so much have a problem here uh, with eating with Gentile believers, but James apparently does, Jesus' brother, which is very interesting because I certainly don't get the impression from Jesus himself that Jesus was particularly uh, bothered by eating uh, with uh, at least tax collectors or prostitutes. This, it, my impression from the book of Mark is that Peter was not uh, very scrupulous, uh, that Jesus was not very worried about the food laws. Um, in fact, Mark 7 interprets Jesus' words as implying that all foods are now clean. Uh, by the way, I, I don't personally find any, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any substance to those who think that Jesus may have been a Pharisee uh, or that Jesus may have had rabbinic ter- uh, tendencies. To, to me, the, the reconstruction of Jesus with regard to the holiness codes that I infer uh, from the Gospels and Acts is that Jesus was, in fact, starkly criticized for his lack of attention to these sorts of details in the law. And so I, I strongly disagree, personally, with those who think that Jesus was a scrupulous keeper of the Jewish law or of kosher food laws and so forth. In fact, I suspect that Peter, as we see him here, Peter up at Antioch, eating with Gentile believers to begin with until people from James come, and then Peter separates himself. To me, this is a reflection of Jesus' own philosophy uh, toward eating with people who were not considered quite right. And in fact, I wonder if this is some of the reason why James had questions about Jesus. I mean, remember, James wasn't on Jesus' side when Jesus was on earth. Uh, James uh, had a visit from Jesus after uh, Jesus rose from the dead, and James believed, and James became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Uh, But this this pressure um, in relation to kosher and holiness codes seems to me to be James. This is James. Uh, This is not uh, Jesus, and I don't think it is particularly uh, Peter. Um, So uh, this is my my reconstruction and, and my sense of things. And so the resolution of this problem, now uh, we'll get to Acts 15, and I'm sure I'll do a scholar or or a a patron video on this issue. But the four um, takeaways uh, after uh, Acts 15 are that I think that what we're really seeing here is the resolution of the question, how can Jewish and Gentile Christians eat together? And the resolution is that as long as the the Gentiles will, will will not... Uh, fall into sexual immorality, as long as they will not eat meat that has been offered to an idol, or meat that has been killed by strangling, or meat that has the blood in it, as long as they will stay away from those four things, then Jewish and Gentile Christians can eat together. I don't think Paul agrees with this, by the way. Paul never mentions such a decree or edict in 1 Corinthians where it would have been very appropriate. I think Paul disagrees. I think this is the resolution of the crisis uh, at Antioch. Uh, these four, uh, these four uh, requirements. And so that, that seems to be the resolution of the issue. Peter, I'm not sure that Peter really cares that much, but he's trying to do the right thing. And I actually, I, I admire him uh, for that. Okay, so reconstructing Peter. Uh, how can we triangulate between these, these so we have, we have three accounts, as it were. Well, actually, we don't have Peter's direct account. Uh, we have Peter on one corner, we have Paul on another corner, and we have Luke on another corner. How can we reconstruct the historical Peter uh, from, from these three? 
Well, I've already given you my, my sense uh, in the first place. I don't think that Peter was a scrupulous law keeper, nor do I think that Jesus, now, I'm not saying that they were flagrant, that they flagrantly violated the kosher laws. That's not what I'm saying. I, I believe that, that like, like most Jews in Galilee, they generally kept the laws. I just don't think that they spent a lot of time worrying about the details of it. Uh, I don't get that in sense from the Gospels. I could be wrong, but I don't think Peter was necessarily a scrupulous uh, uh, holiness code keeper or kosher keeper. Um, and so uh, in that sense, I suspect that the book of Acts um, has given us a more formal picture of Peter uh, than maybe Peter himself would have given. Peter seems a little bit more... Um, of an ideal Jew, let me put it that way. I think Acts may idealize Peter's Jewishness in chapter ten a little bit more than Peter himself would have would have done. Um, have you ever heard somebody who really likes you uh, kind of give an account of who you are or introduce you? I mean, you, it's often the case that when people uh, important people are introduced, they get up and they say, "Well, I'm not sure who." the introducer was talking about, because that, that doesn't seem to be my account. But I wonder if Peter would feel that way about the way that Luke per, uh, presents him in Acts 10, that, that Peter seems a little bit more of an ideal Jew with regard to law keeping in Acts 10 than he might have described himself. Again, I'm trying to, to triangulate here. I'm not, I'm not claiming that my account is the account or that it's an error. Okay, so... Um, now, Luke may have wanted to ground the Gentile mission in Peter. Uh, there, there. In other words, I, I'm not disputing that. Uh, I'm not disputing that this uh, that Peter and Cornelius uh, had a, had a thing. That's not what I'm. That's not what I'm disputing here. But Luke may have had reasons to want to ground the Gentile mission in Peter, because I I suspect that there were probably there were probably some Jewish Christians in the late first century, because um, Jewish Christianity and Gentile Christianity, I think, become in, uh, in some corners increasingly polarized uh, as, the, as the first century goes along. We know of groups like the Ebionites, and we know, we know of a group called the Nazareans. These groups um, eventually will become heretical. Now, um, when, when does a group become heretical? There's no New Testament, you know, canonized yet. But um, there were Jewish groups that did not accept, that, that would have disagreed with the Gospel of John, let's say. There were Jewish groups that believed that Jesus was an anointed human uh, rather than God come to earth. We, we, we know this. We have some of their documents in the New Testament Apocrypha, which are not in anybody's Bible, by the way. And so um, I, I, I feel quite certain that there would have been some Jews in the late first century who would have said, now this Gentile mission is a Paul thing. Paul's a heretic. Paul is a bad person. Paul isn't even a true Jew anymore. He, he's, Paul is a child of the devil who's going to go to Gehenna. I mean, I can hear people saying that. And so there would have been a motivation, I think, in the late first century uh, to connect the Gentile mission uh, to something more foundational than Paul, I think. And so it may very well be, it may very well be that Luke was motivated uh, to to heighten, as it were, to heighten Peter's connection to the Gentile mission. Luke may have had a motivation to connect the Gentile mission uh, to Peter more than, more than you would have had the impression if you'd have been there. Does that make any sense? Again, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about how things are, per, are, are presented. I'm not denying that Peter went to Cornelius. I'm not denying that at all. I'm just saying there may have been a motivation on Luke's part to formalize uh, this this event more than anybody at the time experienced it necessarily. Again, Dan, don't shoot me. Uh, I'm trying. I, I'm saying these things because I'm interested in the truth, and and I think we cook the books a lot. Uh, uh, we we make the text say nice little shiny things that make us feel good about ourselves. Um, and I used to do that too, um, and um, uh, almost lost my faith over it. Uh, because I concluded that I was applying um, my, uh, my, my, whatever smarts I might have, I felt like I was applying to try to make the evidence do what I wanted it to do, rather than letting the chips fall where they actually seemed to lie. 
I'm so anyway. Um, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to take all of the evidence seriously here, um, rather than to um, uh, to kind of uh, have a a, uh, a flat understanding of uh, r rather than uh, a flat character, real three dimensional people, the way people actually are. Um, so. I wonder if Peter was still, I mean, because when you look at what Peter does in Galatians 2, in the light of Acts 10, which happened before Galatians 2, you think, what in the world is Peter doing here? Haven't you remember, don't you, don't you remember, Peter, what happened with Cornelius? You're, you're, I mean, you, you, Peter becomes almost a fiend in Galatians 2, the way he behaves, or, or an idiot. You, you know, he's, he's curly from the Three Stooges. What's wrong with you, Peter? You, this was so clear in Acts 10. Well, my question is, was it really that clear on the ground to Peter? I think Peter was probably genuinely conflicted at Antioch about whether to eat with Gentile Christians or not. I think he was fine himself with doing it. I think he'd had encounter with Cornelius. He'd had encounter with Gentiles. And, and they'd received the Holy Spirit. He believed they were in. And so I think Peter was generally conflicted. It wasn't clear to James, though. Acts 10 was not clear to James, in my opinion, um, uh, at this time. So I think Peter wanted to do the right thing, but it probably wasn't quite yet as clear in his mind as Acts 10 sounds. And so as, as I think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pr present this perspective when we get to Acts 15 as well, it may be that Luke is giving us a kind of a, a summary of the of of what was a longer process that Luke is giving us a position paper. Luke is giving us uh, um, kind of uh, the whole story in one event, something that actually took a lot more processing and a lot more events than just one event. So Luke Acts ten may syncopate as it were an understanding that took a little bit longer on the ground and in. In, in the process, he gives us a foundation story, as it were, what's what we might call a foundation story, uh, for the coming of the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. Would, would Paul have liked Acts 10? I think Paul would have been really annoyed by Acts 10, uh, to be honest, given how hard it was for him um, and how on the outs he seems to have been, on the, on the outskirts of the movement, he seems to have been uh, for a long time uh, in the Gentile missions. I mean, look at, what, uh, you know, Mark, uh, when M John Mark leaves the mission. Why does he leave the mission? I think maybe some of it could be because Paul was really beginning to sense uh, that God was calling him to become the apostle of the Gentiles. Well, I do not claim to be inerrant at all. Um, these are just the musings of somebody trying to be honest, uh, someone trying actually to uh, to get at the truth. Um, and, and if we want to get at the truth, we're going to have to be willing to consider all the perspectives and give them a fair treatment. Um, that's my perspective at least. And, uh, feel free to take what is, what, what is helpful in this video and spit the rest of it out of thy mouth. Um, just spew it from thee. Well, I hope you have a good week. Uh, I think we're going to do Acts 11 and 12, uh, in one week, um, this next week. So have a great Sabbath. Uh, today, I guess Saturday's the Sabbath, isn't it? Have a great Sunday tomorrow, a great Lord's Day tomorrow.